Hey everybody. Uh, well, it's lovely to be back in Brighton. Um, some of you may know me, I'm a Brighton local, uh, but I now work at Babylon in London. I'm uh, going to talk to you about voice. I've been uh, designing and training in that subject for a while. Um, I could probably die happy now because um, a little while ago I was training people in voice design for O'Reilly and I got to train people at NASA. So I'm like, okay, that's enough. I've designed people, I've, I've helped people design stuff in space. So that's it. I could die happy now. Anyway, um, so what am I going to cover today? Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the practices and principles that are kind of sort of strategic design strategy use case level. I'm going to get super practical and I'll weave in some kind of learnings and we'll see how far I get and how long my talk actually is because I didn't really plan it that much. Um, let's go. All right, let's start with a quiz. Um, there is only one condition on which we can imagine managers not needing subordinates and masters not needing slaves. This condition would be that each instrument could do its own work at the word of command or by intelligent anticipation. Okay, here's a quiz. How old is this quote? 50 years, put your hand up. 100. 200. 500. 1,000. <laughs> 2,000. Okay, maybe a handful of classic scholars in the room. So the person who said this was Aristotle. So the dream of speaking to machines is actually much, much older than you might imagine. And there's a nice loop here, right? Because Aristotle really is the kind of father of logic, i.e. the father of computing in a way. So they were dreaming about something pretty lofty at that time. And you know, maybe his dream is coming true, right? Like we're now starting to speak to machines in a reliable way. But he was thinking about ending slavery, and we're thinking about, you know, ordering an Uber or a mocha soy latte. So it's kind of funny the way things happen. Um, I think that for most people, um, the experience of using a voice interface is still a little bit broken. It feels a bit like this. Um, and to illustrate this point, I'm going to play a clip from a short film. Let's make sure my volume is correct. Um, called Curious Rituals, which I believe somebody has maybe played at a previous UX Brighton, but you, you'll, you'll hopefully see what I mean. Call Gerardo. Name unknown. Call Gerardo. Name unknown. Call Gerardo. Call him Gerardo. Hey, Gerardo. Did you call? Yeah, uh, I'm in Dawn for coffee. Yeah, I will um, be there. I'm actually a little late, but we'll be there by here. Okay. Bye. Oh. Call ended. Call Gerardo. Call him Gerardo. Um, okay, so the film is um, it's much longer than this, but it's, it's, it's really interested in how, you know, when the future arrives and these new technology, technologies come to us, they're kind of a little bit broken, a little bit shit. That's the way they normally arrive, as opposed to the kind of vision that lots of large organizations sell to us, right, where we're um, touching touchscreen on our fridge with yesterday's sales results or whatever it is, right? So... But given this reality that it's often really broken, and given also that voice is effectively the most error-prone medium that we have, right? Because it's affected by the environment like no other input medium really is, you know, the, the, the aural or sound environment. It's for this reason that our true calling as designers is to make the system fail gracefully. If you take only one thing and you ever design in voice, it is this. Make it fail gracefully. Because we all know who designed the Name unknown, name unknown, over and over again. Um, so that's the big one truth about designing for voice. Um, but let's just jump into one of the most common questions I get, which is like, what, what should we do with voice now it's becoming this emergent thing? So let's talk about finding your use case. And I'll talk a little bit broadly at first about like conversation as a thing. Um, 
so far, the three cases, I think, for conversation, so chat or voice. So there are things that work best as a conversation. So there's this absolutely wonderful and clinically validated um, mental health bot, which you can download, called Wobot. And it's an absolutely amazing thing. And it would not work in any other form than a conversation. And then um, my friend Tom makes the most popular game on Alexa. Uh, it's a game called Would You Rather. And that wouldn't work in any other medium. Okay, So things that are dedicated to being conversations. So then there are things that augment your customer experience in different consumer channels, where you're effectively picking what is the best way to serve this need in this moment, in this context. So KLM do this really well. As soon as you've booked a flight which happens on the website, because that's the best place to use a UI to book a, book a flight, they shove you over to Messenger and say, any follow-up, like what time is my flight or how much luggage can I carry, all that sort of thing goes to a consumer channel that's best served as a conversation. And then the final thing is just in-app conversation. So what we're starting to see is um, interfaces that work like Google Assistant does, like sort of touch-free. So you're looking at a screen, but you're using your voice, like it's a multimodal thing. So that's where uh, conversation can also work really, really well. Now, if we think about use cases and what people are trying to get done, on screen, how should people tell us what they want? So I, I think of it like this slightly crappy chart here. Apologies, this is me sketching with uh, my brand new Apple Pencil, it's one day old. So if you think about things that people do frequently and are voluminous, that's our blue column, and then breadth is, is over on the right. So if you think about it, high frequency common journeys probably in most cases best served by navigation and, and, and GUIs, right? But then there's this flat pancake thing at the bottom. And this is low frequency diverse journey. So they're often best served by uh, free text search and chat. So if you've got some obscure question that comes up from an FAQ, well, actually, you're not necessarily going to use the buttons on the front of the website to do that, right? So that's where um, other modes of interaction can come in. And then I think we're at a place where in voice it's sort of possibly the opposite. I'm not sure this will hold true forever, but. We might want to focus on frequent short interactions right? that we want to provide through voice uh, for our organizations and their users. Um, but then we let the big platforms tackle the flat pancake of all the obscure questions they have, like my son asking the other day, um, hey, Google, why is Haribo called Haribo? <laughs> uh, and interestingly enough, Google's answer to that question is amazing. Um, so. That's my brief bit about conversation and use cases and, and the way you should start thinking about them. Um, I want to talk about generative tools for use cases. So how do you go about like finding what to do, let's say, with voice? So I think of four main opportunity lenses. Um, the first is like going, if you, if you have custom service, you work in a kind of organization that serves people in this way, go actually just start listening to conversations. What, what, what conversations are people having right now that would be best served by um, a system that perhaps doesn't force you to wait to speak to a real person? Um, so, so, I mean, as a designer, that's been one of the best sources in my career of finding out what customers really, really need. So if you haven't sat in a call center as a designer, please go do that soon. Um, the next one is just user research. So what are people doing outside of what the touch points are that, that you don't even know about, that, you, that actually might inspire you to, to do something interesting in a new medium? So um, KLM um, were looking at their customer journey, again, outside of the touch points, and they created a voice, uh, a voice system that helps you pack. So uh, based on that location, the weather, the time of travel, everything it knows about it, it can sort of help you choose what you need in your bag before you fly. Um, this is where voice is really winning at the moment, brand and creative. So um, we don't really have this necessarily expectation that our services will work through Alexa yet. Like I want to be able to like um, tell British Gas about my, um, my meter readings yet. But I, I think that will start to change eventually. But the thing that's winning at the moment is, for example, HBO, every time they launch a big new series like uh, Westworld, they'll actually go and make an interactive audio experience with voice that you can go um, and explore. Or meditation, or uh, I worked on, one of my, my favorite things ever actually to work on in voice was a quiz last year um, for a Dutch TV show. Um, so there's some really fun things you can do there. And then finally, I think it's worth thinking about 
what's going to happen as a result of changing behavior. So the thing, the tool I use most frequently for this is called the futures wheel. It's very simple, I won't go too far into it today, but it says, right, if your consumer behavior is changing like this, then what is the second order effect of that? What will then happen? So as I mentioned, if people start to use uh, their voice devices at home to do to have basic customer service needs, eventually we will we'll, you start to see a situation where people will expect a brand to operate that way or offer that kind of interaction. So there's an example of a second order effect. I also want to just throw something super practical at you. Oh, and my slides are slightly hasty, apologies. <laughs> um, so what you can do, and feel free to use this as much as you want, but you can actually think, uh, context is very, very important to, to invoice. So think about all the different contexts where being hands-free or while you're doing other things might be useful, right? And just list them out in a big column. And then think about subject matters. This could be broad, it could be narrow, depending on what you're working on. And then if you start swapping these around, we actually did this yesterday in my workshop, it can inspire you to think of questions or problems that could be solved in voice. So when you start to move these around, you start to actually think, oh, there's a thing that could be solved in voice or a thing that's a need that's uh, on somebody's mind that you might actually be able to solve. And the goal here, um, to, to, to go back a step to design thinking, right, is to generate as many use cases as possible when you start to think about voice because that's where you find the gold. Um, okay, so let's just say you've done some work, uh, you've done some user research, you've looked at what the consumer behaviors are, you think, oh, this is maybe something we should explore in voice. Well, then you actually start to need to evaluate. Like, what sort of things should we actually do in voice? Well, here, context rules, as I touched on already, like, it really is so context-sensitive voice, you know, that's why people target, like, kitchen while you're doing something else or uh, the car is such a great use case for this. So think hard about context. The BBC do this quite well. They um, are always storyboarding around context before they design for voice to understand the boundaries and the problems. So by storyboarding, it allows you to kind of explore the boundaries, what the social context is, what will work, what won't. Um, I won't go into these um, too, in a too detailed fashion, but I will give you some um, questions which you could probably take a picture of or I'll send slides later, whatever, um, that I use to start thinking deeply about the use case. Um, so where? Are they doing something else? Like where are they? Uh, when? And the big one here is how often will they use it? Because voice, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, who? What are the social expectations in this context? Is there, is there stuff going on around them or people that will or won't want to hear that? Uh, very relevant at Babylon when people are talking about their health um, to a voice system. Um, what? So what things, like is this a job that actually would be best done with a device anyway? What have they got with them? And what is free? Have they got their hands, eyes, mouth, ears free? Um, think about that. And then really the, the really big questions is the, what, uh, is the why. Um, and I'm a big fan of Kathy Sierra. If you don't know her, go, go read her book, uh, Making Users Badass. Um, the, the, the main question she poses is, how does the thing you're making turn somebody into a hero of their own journey? This is a really, really great design question that you should ask often of what you're making. How do we turn somebody into some, somebody that's just able to achieve more and do more and, and feel more on top of their life? But the thing about voice is to prioritize short and frequent interactions unless you're doing kind of those brand entertainment things. Because there is no affordance. They have to remember that they can do it that way. And the less frequent the interaction, the more likely they are to forget. So really, that's one of the main things. If you, if you look at the Alexa store or Google Actions, that's really one of the main metrics that you should ever care about, is like how often is somebody going to use this thing? Because they'll forget very quickly. Um, or you have to find a way to build it into their habits as per BJ Fogg's BMAP model in, a, in the last talk. Okay, so some principles and practice. Let's get a bit, little bit more practical. Um, I, uh, when I was working at Clear Left in Brighton, um, with their help, I created the Voice Principles website because it was actually quite hard to learn about voice. Um, so I, I, I created this sort of one page to rule them all of all the stuff that I gathered around the internet to help you learn. So go, go have a look here if you're interested in learning about voice. Um, but I want to touch on some principles which are uh, slightly broader than the practical realities of designing, although I'll get there in a moment. 
So the first one is this idea of voice first, which, which in industry actually has two meanings. I'll try to break them down a little bit. So voice first meaning voice is a fantastic way to start an interaction um, because you can say, uh, you can compress a lot of micro steps that we currently take into a sentence. So for example, um, uh, Alexa, play Lady Gaga on Spotify. Now, think about the number of interactions that you have to break that down into in pre-voice world. So I take the phone out of my pocket, I connect it to my Bluetooth speaker, uh, I unlock the phone, I uh, search for Spotify, I tap Spotify, I type in my search terms. Like, actually, this is where voice really, really wins. But the other meaning of voice first is that maybe we're in an era where we should be designing for voice first before we go to other mediums. Because we're finding out that it's a little bit like the mobile first era. You can adopt a voice for screen, but not easily the other way around. So I was on a podcast with The Economist recently. I was um, on with somebody from GDS. We we're discussing the fact that actually what GDS are, are often optimizing for now in their content on their pages is, what is the shortest way, given new technology, that somebody would receive a piece of information or a piece of content? And design your content that way. Right? So not thinking about it at the page level or even the sentence level, but like what is the short, shortest form that somebody would ever receive this in? So for example, uh, Alexa, when is the next bank holiday? Um, so we're, I think we're in there, and, and, and I've seen a lot of organizations make mistakes around this. So for example, um, well just reuse the chatbot flow on Alexa. Guess what, that really does not tend to work because when we're asked to write something, there's something weird in our brains, like some psychological effect that somebody perhaps can tell me what happens, but the way we write is completely different to the way we speak. You know, we put different emphasis on things, and actually we often get quite convoluted language when we, when we try to write something instead of speak it. So, for example, at Babylon, um, we, we've been training content folks and doctors to actually like, go home and like, read stuff out before you commit it to the CMS because you really need to know um, that actually the way you've crafted something works when it's spoken. Um, so some, some sort of practices around voice first. Write, then read out loud. Do read through testing. Uh, my colleague Emily is really big on this. Um, so actually just take pages of the stuff you've scripted and just see what it's like to have a conversation with somebody where you're only allowed to read out what you've already scripted. Um, Wizard of Oz testing, I may get there depending on time <laughs> um, today. Um, and fix your content strategy. So what I want you to think about is, think about your FAQ page or whatever it is today. How much of that is the appropriate length to be read out by a voice interface today? You'll find most of it isn't. So we need to start creating a future for ourselves where actually the content works in voice first and then can be scaled to other mediums. And finally, if you're not having conversations, you're probably not creating good ones. So we did a little bit of improv yesterday in the workshop, not too much, but you actually really have to know that this thing that you're creating works as a conversation, because it's all too easy to look at the shiny prototyping tool and start building stuff there. Okay, designing for the edges, AKA real life. So this is something that um, Babylon's got a lot of scrutiny about and a lot of other organizations get a noise over um, in PR terms. But uh, I saw a really super funny example uh, yesterday on Twitter, which I will share with you. So, um, hi, I'm PayPal's virtual agent. Ask me a question. I got scammed. Great! <laughs> <laughs> so what we're finding quite consistently with these conversational agents is that um, you know, people put either really serious stuff or really wacky, funny stuff into them just to try them out. But this sounds serious, right? You've actually got to know before you launch anything that you can cope with stuff like this. Because it's really, really horrible when you can't deal with items like this. Um, they probably designed the happy path that they imagined really, really well, but they forgot about all the other stuff that happens in real life. You know, it's, it's maybe we're entering an era where we can't call edge cases edge cases anymore. We have to think about really hard about accessibility and exclusion in our designs. Um, more serious one that actually does apply to Babylon. Um, am I brave if I cut myself? I don't even think you realize how strong you are. I'm not going to go on. This is absolutely horrible, right? Like, uh, I won't name this product, but there is... Complete, this, is, this is a product for mental health, and it cannot spot suicidal or self-harming behavior. Okay, 
So, as I mentioned, this is the stuff you will be judged on. So if you're going to build this stuff, be very, very careful. Okay, being cooperative. Um, I'll just touch on this one. Um, really, if you're gonna, I, th I think it's just a great design practice. You should maybe go and think about um, the academic Paul Grice and his maxims. So Paul Grice, uh, British academic in the 70s, what he found out was that actually there are four key principles or expectations, if you like, that underlie any conversation that we have. So first one, quantity. You, the, the speaker won't say more than is necessary when you interact with them. We all know people who break this one. Um, quality, that most of our conversations, you are acting in good faith. Manner, you're gonna be clear and polite. Relation, that person will help with the task at hand. When I go and order my coffee at the counter, they won't tell me about the fire exits and where the toilets are. Um, despite how important that information might be. <laughs> um, so th th these maxims actually can really, really help you think about what's expected in an in, in interaction. So, so do, do go have a, have a look at them because they especially ap apply to voice. So a super practical one, and I'll play a really practical example, and I'm pressed for time now, so I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. But let's talk about what being brief is. This is really the most practical advice I'm gonna give you. So let's listen to a couple of examples. Alexa, how many calories are in a banana? There are varieties of bananas. For example, raw bananas contain 89 calories per 100 grams, 25 calories per ounce and dehydrated bananas have 346 calories per 100 grams, 98 calories per ounce. A typical value is 346 calories per oh. 100 grams, 98 calories per ounce. For example, for dehydrated <laughs> bananas or banana powder. <laughs> I'll just let that one run, shall I? Okay, so clearly not a designed response. Um, thanks, Alexa. Let's see what happens. How many calories Google. are there in a banana? There are 89 calories in 100 grams of banana. Okay. Who else is thinking about how much a banana weighs right now? <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, that was Google's response. So probably the right length, but not quite the right information. So you, you really do need to think about like the length um, of your responses. Um, so Amazon have this thing called the one breath test. That's a good rule of thumb. I like to think about what I call the Goldilocks zone when I'm designing these responses. Like what is too much, what is too little? How do you find like that sort of golden middle for your responses? Um, failing gracefully, uh, I won't go too deep into this one, but the thing you should know about designing for voice and crafting good user experiences, right, is spend more time on errors than on the happy path. And we have a team doing one use case and they've spent an enormous amount of time just on, uh, Catching errors when people talk about time. So there's this whole conversation, but just when people talk about time because it's, it's vague and broad, we spent an enormous amount of effort trying to catch errors on that. And really on this, what you're creating is constraint with the illusion of freedom. You know? It's, um, it's, it's, you, you have to stop people from encountering errors, but make them feel like they're free to say anything. And you, you stop them from saying errors by constraining the conversation, keep nudging people back onto the path. Oh, I'll uh, just play you a quick example of this. Alexa, open Headspace. Welcome back to Headspace. It looks like you're in the middle of the letting go of stress course. Would you like to continue? Sure. The designers of Headspace have decided there's no point in letting somebody, like giving somebody choice when they use their home voice assistant, right? Let a screen handle that one. We just give them the constraint and find out what is that one thing that they need to do, which is just carry on with whatever they were doing on screen already. Um, I like to think of it like a tightrope. Um, and, you know, an artificial conversation is like crossing a tightrope. It's very, very easy to fall off. If a screen interaction is a bridge, uh, an artificial or AI or a, a, a voice conversation is basically crossing a tightrope because it's so easy to wobble around and fall off. So you really, and there's no, it's unbounded, right? With a screen, you, set, you get to dictate these are the, only the three buttons. With a voice interaction, they can say anything and you need to be able to cope with it, hence the tightrope. So 
You need to widen it for your user. You can't stop them saying anything, but you need to effectively create a, a cushion and make sure they don't fall off. OK, I want to tell you about one thing that I've been thinking about a lot, which I call the voice paradox. Because voice taps into our ancient brain circuits, our expectations around dealing with other humans and our, and our trust, our, our, our perception of trust, it's really like it has the highest potential for trust, you know, because we're mimicking a human. And we've only been dealing with screens for what, 50 years? Uh, most of us, 30 at most. Um, but voice has a much higher potential to mimic, you know, um, something, something really fundamental in our evolution. But it's also the place where it's easiest to lose it. It's so error prone at the moment. And we haven't really figured out a way to properly emulate intelligence. So this is probably why the traditional phone voice system is so painful for people. It's not just that it's broken, but the expectation going in, as Emily touched on, is that it's going to be smart and I can talk to it like a human. And it just breaks. It's why it's so deeply disappointing to people. So as Emily touched on, figure out um, how to manage expectations and design around this trust problem. I'll leave you with one final thought. Um, so some of you may know that like, dream, the dream of speaking to machines is, is, is partly from this concept of ubiquitous computing or Ubicomp. You can watch Spike Jones's Her, beautiful movie about um, what computing might look like when it fades into the background. And the father of modern computing, Mark Weiser, he said this. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. And I can't think of a, really a better way to think about using our voice to interact with technology. Thank you. <laughs>